you. I uh, want to applaud you guys for bucking the, uh, not only the coronavirus, but also the curse of Friday the 13th. You know? So that's a double whammy, that's a perfect storm, and uh, you are to be commended for your bravery. Um, uh, Rob wanted me to say just a little bit about, about when I first started teaching at, at uh, Green Bay East High School. I had come to the Lord just uh, prior to that, and it was interesting, when I came to the Lord, it wasn't because somebody argued me into the kingdom. You know, I, nobody gave me a ton of evidences against my theistic evolution viewpoints. Um, when the Holy Spirit spoke to me, first thing he said was, what are you going to do about evolution? And uh, that wasn't my wife speaking, <laughs> by the way. Uh, that was just uh, something that was in my heart. And... Um, so I, I did a lot of, a lot of studies on it, um, read a lot of Henry Morris's stuff, and back in, the, back in the late 70s, that's about all there was. You know? uh, there, we didn't have AIG, we didn't have all the internet, we didn't have all the, the, uh, the resources that we've got today. No creation museum. Uh, so uh, I was uh, uh, kind of on a shoestring there, shoestring budget, but um, I, I plunged into it and my first teaching job after uh, becoming a Christian was to teach biology in a public high school. And, uh, and I, I was very gung-ho about it, as my wife can attest. Um, I felt that I needed to present the two-model approach, which was legal at that time in Wisconsin. Well, unfortunately, my first principal that I had was a former biology teacher, and he was a contributing author to the uh, Colorado uh, BSCS, for, are you guys familiar with the Colorado, the BSCS series of biology books? They had uh, a number of them, yellow, blue, and green versions. And the blue version was called Molecules to Man. And the whole, the whole premise, the whole textbook was based on the whole idea of molecules evolving into life and then onward and upward into human life. Um, so that was what I was up against. So after about two years of, of battling with my principal and getting a lot of negative reviews, <laughs> uh, I ended up teaching chemistry for the rest of my career, which I, I thoroughly enjoyed because it, it's, it, it's less philosophical than biology. There's less, uh, uh, fewer stories than in biology, and it's uh, much better science. And, uh, and I could speak with authority on laws that dealt, the, uh, dealt uh, negatively when it came to evolution. So I shared that with my students. And um, so that also got me into some trouble. So even in chemistry, I got into trouble. So, uh, but anyway, I've enjoyed speaking for the last, uh, I don't know, is it going on 50 years? 40. Going on 40, easily. So. Uh, Started with the old transparencies, overhead transparencies, and then progressed you know, into PowerPoint, so here I am. So, we'll get started here. This slide has been up for about a, a half an hour, so I'm sure you've all seen it. And you probably, maybe some of you have scratched your head and said, how can that be that the same word can be exactly the, the opposite? Well, obviously definitions are important. Whenever I teach science, I always tell the kids when it, there's a question or there's a quotation mark around the, the word science. It means the atheistic science, the science that, that totally uh, eliminates God from the picture. In other words, God's laws cannot, we can't call them God's laws of nature. We can't say that God intervenes in any way. Um, so it's a very atheistic um, uh, look at nature. No intelligence or intelligent design is allowed. Uh, real science includes God as the author of his word and his world and, uh, and natural laws are written by God and all nature points to God. And, uh, and so this is uh, uh, the science that I'm dealing with that I'm talking about is the, the, the real science and I believe that real science does agree 100% with the Bible. Now, there is an organization called BioLogos, which I'm sure a lot of you are, how many of you are familiar with BioLogos? All right, a, a, 
a few hands. Uh, it is, uh, if you investigate them, you'll find that they are, I believe, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, they try to mainstream evolution into Christian churches, colleges, and seminaries. And, uh, and of course, they promote theistic evolution. Uh, and my, my view of theistic evolution is that it's 1% theistic and about 99% evolution. There is very little of God in theistic evolution, and what there is of God is a very small God. And we're going to talk about that tonight. So, enough said about Biologos. Uh, Genesis 1, Awesome God, is the title of tonight's, tonight's talk here. Blowing the socks off of today's scientific culture. And we live in a scientific culture. And we are incredibly impressed by science, as we should be, in a lot of respects. But it doesn't hold all the answers to, you know, to everything. Alright, we're going to look for these themes, and I'm just going to read these, because these are important themes that we're going to be covering tonight. Um, Genesis 1 through 11 provides the presuppositions, and we're going to be talking a lot about presuppositions tonight. Presuppositions for a biblical worldview, which will affect how you view God, the Bible, and man. And if you don't get these presuppositions right, it's going to totally change your, your view of Scripture. God's word and world, nature and science, will not contradict each other. Now, we've got guys like Hugh Ross, who say that science is the 67th book of the Bible. Uh, of course, the difference between 1 through 66 is that it's totally inerrant. And book 67, which he calls, you know, the book of nature, right, is if fallen. It is mutated. It is degenerating at a rapid rate. And so, to, to even dare to compare the book of science with the other 66 books of the Bible is a, it, it, it's almost, uh, uh, it's a tra travesty is what I call it. Genesis 1 is loaded with many scientific principles. We'll be talking, we're not going to cover all of them tonight, but we'll certainly try to get to a lot of them. Many of God's attributes are showcased in Genesis 1. All of God's attributes are equal in magnitude. You know, the, the thing is today, everybody talks about God as love, 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 Nobody talks about God as holy and powerful and, uh, and we're accountable to him. And so, but they're all equal in magnitude. So as powerful as God is portrayed through nature, he is just that, that holy. And we have offended not only a very powerful God, but a very holy God. So, you know, the first, I always thought, I mean, for years and years, I always said that the first scientific experiment in the Bible with Daniel chapter 1. You know, the famous, the famous uh, nutrition experiment. And you can see that, that Daniel had uh, an experimental hypothesis. He had a test group, a control group, results, implementation. I mean, this was the perfect package for a scientific experiment. Um, but, you know, I, I've, I've changed my mind on that. And I'll, we'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, what is science? Is it just the natural sciences? We've got a lot of natural sciences, right? But we've also got political sciences, social sciences, computer sciences, medical science, mathematical sciences. There are a lot, a lot of sciences, hundreds of branches of sciences. And the word science comes from the word scans, meaning to know, right? And to know what? Well, they want to know everything about every subject. So every subject wants to know the truth about, right, what it's teaching. Right? Theology is the queen of the sciences. And so, and theology wants to know about God. So, part of our lecture tonight is on, right, theology. We want to get a, a deeper understanding of what God is really like. The, uh, I think it's the Lutheran Catechism that says, the chief aim of man is to know God and give him glory. So, I'm, I'm hoping tonight we're going to know more about him and we're going to be able to give him more glory. All right. Purpose of science. Let's take a look here. And I'm just going to read these bullets because I think they're pretty important. To help us build a realistic, true picture of the world and our place in it. A biblical worldview. 
And that's really the rage today, isn't it? A worldview. You got a speaker coming up and clash of worldviews, right? Next, uh, is it next? Yeah, next, okay. Um, so you got the secular worldview versus the biblical worldview, and, and uh, your worldview it colors it, how you're going to read scripture to help us build a forensic faith. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard the term forensic faith as opposed to faith or blind faith. Okay, well, we're going to talk about forensic faith. Um, you know, in Romans 1.20, Paul wrote 2,000 years ago that we were, how did he put it? Without excuse. Because there was so much evidence in nature and that was before the invention of the microscope, the telescope, you know, all these scopes and all these instruments that, that give us more knowledge about nature. And yet 2,000 years ago, they had plenty of evidence to convict people for not believing in God. How much more so today? Scientists today should be the number one believers in God. And yet I think they're pretty far down the list. Uh, it's going to help us with the d dominion mandate to rule over the earth. Right? Take charge of it. It's going to help make life better through technology, you know, because people are created in God's image. You know, so God wants us to ease the burden on people and treat them more like children of God rather than than um, than pack animals. All right. I think today the first scientific experiment is found in Genesis chapter three. That's about as close as you can get to the beginning, right? I mean, if this is true, then this definitely would be the first. All right, the hypothesis in Genesis 3 was, well, eating the forbidden fruit increased my knowledge. Right? Right? That's a, that's a good... I mean, he's trying to discover more about... Adam is trying to discover more about, you know, about God and his relationship with God. And so, you know, maybe if I eat this fruit, right, and it looks good, Snake sounds pretty convincing, right? So, he does the experiment. Eats the fruit. And of course, we know the results, don't we? Alright. So, Adam and Eve were using themselves as the control group and the test group. Kind of before and after. Well, before I ate the fruit, now after I ate the fruit. Alright? And of course, uh, we know that Adam didn't die immediately. If, if you have a Bible and you turn to the second or third page, that's the watershed. That is the watershed, isn't it? Before that, we've got the Garden of Eden, and after that, we've got the field of thistles and thorns. All right. Now, Adam died prematurely at the age of 930 years. Now, you say, wait. Well, that's not premature. Oh yeah, it is. He should have lived. He should be alive today. Right? If he hadn't sinned, right? And no, nope, we'd be alive. He'd be alive today with us. Interesting. All right. You know, Satan was so successful with his corruption of mankind that he started saying, hey, I'm going to use that same technique, right? Uh, I'm going to just keep asking questions to introduce doubt into people's minds. So here's a lot of questions here. A lot of questions. I'm sure you've seen this. You probably have a lot. I'm going to throw up a bunch more. Who did Cain marry? That's a, that's a good one, right? And how did Noah get all the animals on, the, on board the boat? And the virgin birth and, you know, People rising from the dead? You've got to be kidding. Three days in a whale's belly for Jonah? Uh, you know, these are some phenomenal stories. Right? Dinosaurs lived with Adam? At the Creation Museum, they've got dinosaurs, and that's one of the number one complaints from the atheist community, isn't it? They dare to show dinosaurs and people living together at the same time. Don't they know that there was hundred million years separating them? All right. So true science should give us God-honoring answers to many, if not most, of these questions. Right? True science should give us some good God-answering answers. All right, let's take a look at faith. 
Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, conviction of things not seen, it says in Hebrews 11.1. 1. By faith we understand the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Now that could mean ex nihilo, right? Creation, or it could mean things being made out of atoms. We don't know. I like Tony Evans, you know, the black preacher. I like his, uh, his definition of faith. Faith is acting like God is telling the truth, right? Not just on Sunday morning, but throughout the entire week. Right? Acting, not just professing it with your mouth and saying, yes, I believe, but actually living it out. That is, that's faith. You know, and scientists postulate and hypothesize about all kinds of invisible things. I don't know why they're so hung up about God, because the evidence is much stronger for God than it probably is for an electron. All right, so what definition of faith are we going to use? There is unreasonable faith. Now, what's unreasonable faith? Well, it's faith that is, is, is in despite of the evidence or despite the lack of evidence, all right? You know, evolutionists have a lot of faith because they believe in evolution despite all the evidence that it never happened and despite all the evidence there is for creation, which diametrically opposes it. Then we have what's called blind faith, shallow faith, ignoring the evidence. You know, I've got kids in high school that said to me, Mr. Kraft, you don't need to tell me about all this evidence. I, I think they are really just too lazy to learn it, you know. But they said, we don't, I don't need to learn all this evidence because I believe in the Bible just the way it's written, you know. I don't need this. I am so, you know, I, I'm so sincere in my, so, you know, in my faith that I just don't need it. And of course, they haven't been to college yet, have they? They haven't sat in a freshman biology class with an atheistic professor breathing down their neck after he's identified them as a Christian and he's going to make an example out of them. Right? And so, and of course the media is constantly barraging us with all this, all these stories about you know, prehistoric man and dinosaurs and, and hundreds of millions of years of evolution and you know, after swimming upstream for so many years, you eventually give up and you capitulate and you say, okay, I'll, I'll become an evolutionist or I'll believe in theistic evolution, okay? So, um, that's blind faith. Jesus did not ask his followers to believe without evidence. How much evidence did Jesus give the apostles? How much? An avalanche of evidence. Thousands and thousands of miracles. Now, why didn't the apostles believe? Some of them did. And every once in a while, a profession of faith that said, you are the Lord, the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was few and far between, though, wasn't it? And Jesus applauded them when that happened. But uh, they, weren't, they weren't always tracking with them. So why not? They had presuppositions about Jesus, didn't they? The Pharisees had presuppositions about Jesus. They were expecting a military leader who was going to dominate over the Romans. They were going to lead them out of their, their predicament. All right? And so, even though the, the Pharisees and the apostles saw all these miracles, you know, there was a lot of unbelief. Forensic faith is what we're going to be talking about tonight, a lot. And, uh, and that is faith that's supported by the evidence. Come, you know, that word forensic, I'm not sure exactly where it comes from, but you hear forensic medicine, right? Dead bodies and murders and, you know, who, who did it and why did it happen and how this person died. And so all these different evidences give, you know, are used to support a particular uh, invisible cause of death. And so we're going to be looking at that, uh, the importance of your organization as providing evidence to support someone's faith for growing the roots deeper into the soil so they're not going to wither when uh, things turn a little dry. Uh, 1 Peter 3.15 says, uh, 
but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So we are instructed, we are instructed to have some evidences in our repertoire of, of apologetic arguments. All right? Every doubt morphs into a denial. Now look at what look at what what, what how Satan worked here. Did God really say he created in six days? That's how he started. And how did it end up? Well, in, in the case, you know, we're talking about with creation, he starts with, did God really say he created in six days? And then, of course, the, the truth comes out when he says, evolution is true. It's a fact. You can't believe in creation. Right? He doesn't start off with that, but he morphs into that. So we get uh, time mutations and natural selection is all you need. God is no longer necessary. We have scientifically disproven the need for God. Right? That's the story that we get from evolution. All right? We all need that full armor of God, don't we? That you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So here we see that scheme, and it's, it's been used successfully for thousands of years. So we have to have presuppositions. We've got to have presuppositions. Presuppositions are things that cannot be proven. You cannot prove that God exists scientifically, but they should be confirmed by the evidence. You cannot prove that creation happened, but it should be confirmed by the evidence. Okay? So as, as young earth creationists, we have a number of presuppositions. Right? Young earth, God exists. Right? instantaneous ex nihilo creation. Now, the atheist has presuppositions. Let's take a look at it. He says, no God, cosmos happened by accident, Bible isn't true, design is only apparent, it only looks design, it ain't really. The theist says, God is, he is the creator, designer, he cannot lie. So, the, the Genesis 1 is a eyewitness account of creation, right? so we can take that to the bank. God's word and his word should match up. Right? That's a presupposition. And of course the evidence keeps piling up that it does, does match up. The Bible is scientifically and historically accurate. And archaeologically accurate. I mean, in, in so many ways it's, it's been verified. Okay. Now, once presuppositions are internalized, once they're internalized, once you've got them in your, in your heart, in your brain, it becomes very difficult for evidence against it to break through. Right? In other words, it's a filter. It filters out the garbage. And we get a lot of garbage coming into our receptors, don't we? You know? National Geographic, you know, PBS, you know, uh, just all kinds of the, the internet, public education, even Christian education. And a lot of our Christian colleges are, are pushing different forms of evolution. So we have to have presuppositions that will filter out the garbage. Now, do you get frustrated when you give somebody evidence and they just blow you off? They say, I don't care about that evidence. But what about this? What about that? When you, when you witness to people, you're going to get that. That people will not accept your bona fide, verifiable evidence. They're not going to believe that. They've got a presupposition that that is all phony baloney. They filter that out. Pretty hard to break through. And sometimes it takes years and years and years, and finally the Holy Spirit does His work, right? And He changes their heart. And it does take a change heart in prayer, oftentimes, most of the times, to get that through. Alright, so don't give up when you're, you're witnessing to people because their presuppositions are filtering out 90% of what you're telling them. Alright, we've got a lot of descriptors of God, including the word awesome, which is totally overused, overblown, um, misused, uh, trivialized, uh, cheapened, and so on. So I, 
I even I, I don't even like to talk about God as being awesome anymore because it right in there with you know an ice cream sundae with nuts and a cherry on top and whipped cream you know it's just because um, you you hear so many people misusing that word but we are much more prone to underestimate God because we have nothing to compare God to. Uh, and so we, we always underestimate God. We, we don't have a clue as to how powerful He is, how omniscient He is, how holy He is, how sovereign He is. Don't have a clue. And uh, so I'm hoping, you know, that we can, we can kind of, right, up our view of God a little bit tonight. Uh, let's take a look at the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, you know, in the beginning tells us that time had a beginning. Time is a created element. Right? God, Elohim, is in the plural form here, which kind of gives us an idea that there, you know, the Trinity is on the horizon. And he is the primal cause. And you have to have a primal cause for the universe. It's either the Big Bang, creation out of nothing by accident, by a, a, a quantum fluctuation, or it's God. Take your pick. Uh, created is the word, is the Hebrew word bara, ex nihilo creation out of nothing. Uh, he creates time, heavens, and earth. And uh, time, space, and matter make up a trinity, a physical trinity which rely upon each other. In order, You can't have time without matter. Right in space. Okay, so it's, it's some interesting relationships there. Um, the first verse, and I, I don't, I don't read Hebrew very well, so I'm just going to show you the Hebrew letters, and and of course we're reading from right to left, right, not left to right like we do. Um, so in the beginning, uh, God created, and then right after the word God, there's two little letters, two little letters. I don't know if you can. Let's see if my uh, right here, these two letters right here. The Aleph and Tau, the Aleph and Tau are the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And uh, so it's almost like saying, if we, were to if we were to read this in Greek, you know, it would be in the beginning, uh, God, the Alpha and Omega, created the heavens and the earth. Interesting. It looks, it almost looks as if Jesus Christ is being introduced in the first verse of the Bible. Wow. Interesting. Okay. The clothespin. Did I bring a Oh, Cheryl, did I bring a clothespin? <laughs> I think. All right. Might have it. Might check my uh, my bag there. Anyway, the clothespin is a model of Genesis one one. Uh, you know, God created. Time, space, and matter, right? Three things. But um, I like the clothespin because, um, you know, it's only got three pieces. Uh, and there are basically three things necessary, three things involved in any physical object in the universe. Three components that make up every physical object in the universe. Uh, one of them would be what we call matter. That's atoms and molecules. Uh, needed for assembly and operating. What would that be? Energy. Right? And how about found only in God and man? Intelligence, right? Smart. All right. So try building a clothespin with intelligence, with information. That's our creation model. And uh, what I typically do, is there one in there? Think, That's okay. I think they actually know what a clothespin looks like. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I like to have a physical. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Good catch. Oh, yeah, I love it. Great dinosaur model, too. You know, it's got, a, got very ferocious jaws. All right. Uh, now, what I, what I love to do with little kids, I mean, kids from second, third, fourth grade on up, is, uh, you know, I tell them, okay, now this is, a, this is a model of a dinosaur. Great for your grandkids, too. And this will help to kind of evolution proof them. Right? Let's get them started because in kindergarten they're reading about dinosaurs living hundreds of millions of years ago. Right? That's in kindergarten book. So, you know, you gotta you gotta be right there with them, right, to counteract that. So 
you say, okay, here is, here is a model of a dinosaur, and it's made up of two sticks and a spring, and I'm going to have you study that real carefully, you know, and then I'm going to ask you to take the thing apart, right, and put it back together again. So they've got a reason to study this, right? They've got a reason to study, because they've got to get that information from the clothespin into their brain so they can use that to put the clothespin back together again. And it's fun to watch them because, you know, little kids, second, third grade, they really struggle. But then as they, they get older and older, you know, you get into fourth, fifth, sixth graders, you know, they, they're better with their hands and they can, right, they can do that kind of stuff. And so they eventually succeed in putting the clothespin back together, right? Now, try that same, that's with information, isn't it? That is creating the clothespin or assembling it with information. Now have them try it without information. Just matter and energy. Put it in a, in a, uh, a Folgers, I, I found that Folgers coffee cans work the best. They really do, they work the best. You put the three pieces in the Folgers coffee can and then you have them shake it until their little arms are about ready to fall off. And, uh, and then you ask them, well, what do you think? Do you think the clothespin is gonna get put back together again? Uh-uh, Grandpa, no way. It took me 10, 15 minutes to put that clothespin together, and I'm a smart boy, right? Now, Elvis would say, you know, just a whole lot of shaking is going to get the job done, right? And evolution would say the same thing. Just time and chance is all you need, right, to put that clothespin together. And yet, nature cannot even put a clothespin together. Nature cannot even put a single clothespin together no matter how much time you give. You can take it to Home Depot and say, would you please put this in your paint shaker and shake it over the weekend while your store is closed or, you know, during the coronavirus uh, shutdown or whatever, and, you know, after, after two weeks in the paint shaker, it's going to be all busted up and splintered and, right? Not going to work, is it? So let's take that same principle. We'll call, I call it the principle of comparative difficulty. If a task that requires less in effort, like a clothespin, is too difficult to accomplish, then a task that requires more effort, like let's say putting a mouse trap together, how about putting a car together or a computer together, right, is going to be even more difficult, right? So, I mean, here we've got a close here. Let's look at this this uh, clothespin to mouse trap to living cells. Right? Gets harder and harder and harder, right? And you can't even put a clothespin together by shaking it up. So try that with a mouse. You get the idea? All right, where I'm going with this. All right. Now, let's look at economic predictions. You know, pretty, it was pretty hard to predict the economy that's upon us right now two months ago, isn't it? Right? So imagine trying to predict it decades in the future. All right? How about weather predictions? You know? Daily weather man, you know, I, I, most people would get fired for the, the, the incompetency of most weathermen, right? In terms of predi prediction, and that they're trying to tell us what's going to happen a hundred years in the future with global warming and so on. All right, so recent past history, ancient history, local government, enough problems, let's have a one world government. That'll make it simpler, right? No, no. All right, so all these things have two things in common. They have hundreds of thousands of factors influencing them, and the larger, longer-term tasks are definitely more difficult, or let's say, more impossible. All right, real science does include God. I'm going to go through these very quickly. Uh, there's lots of good reasons why we, we need God in the equation for logic, accountability. Uh, you know, uh, he's the eyewitness. He is an eyewitness, uh, intelligent designer. All right. Is the author of man's moral uh, moral laws as well as our natural laws, and of course, you know, people don't like that. They don't like accountability. All right, let's look at the first law of thermodynamics, which speaks very strongly against evolution. And I love this in chemistry. I just love this because I could actually use the word create in chemistry, and I didn't get in trouble. All right, matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed. They can only change form. So matter can turn into matter, 
Man, energy can turn into different forms of energy, and matter can turn into energy, right? As in atomic bomb blasts and things like that, right? So E equals MC squared. Right? So that's the first law. So you might say, remember, you might say, well, wait, if, if matter can't be created, where did it all come from? It was created. But wait a minute. <laughs> you see the problem I'm, I'm going to be getting myself into here? Right? So what's the solution here? Remember, this is a natural law. This is a law of nature, not a law of God. Right? This is a natural law. It took God, who transcends nature, to create, na to create matter. In other words, God is outside of the universe. He can speak into the universe, and he can create matter, and energy, and people, right? Incredible things. All right. Um, so in the beginning, uh, you know, an eternal universe was the belief of science for thousands of years. They believed that matter was eternal. But the second law of thermodynamics back in the 1950s is what forced the issue. Let's take a look real quick at the second law. You're all familiar with it because you're all getting older. Your houses might need a little bit of repair. You know, your husband may have dinged the door on the car and that needs to be repaired. You got to go to the doctor for this, you know, this thing or, or that thing, all right? The second law tells us that matter goes from order to disorder and you can count on it, right? It doesn't go from disorder to order, right? It just doesn't happen. Now, you can overcome the second law with a little bit of intelligent energy being applied. Right? For example, you can go to the doctor to help your, with your health, go to the body shop for your car, right? call in the roofer to put a new roof on your house, and so on. So you can, you can overcome and slow down the second law, but sure shooting, it's going to eventually get all of us. All right. Now the problem is that there's no natural source of intelligence in nature. No intelligent force in nature. Uh, nature has an IQ of exactly what class? Zero. Thank you. <laughs> it's exactly zero. I like to say that nature is as dumb as a rock. Because that is what it is. Right? It is a rock. All right. So the second law Applied it, it, it applied originally to heat and energy. It was they developed this during the age of the steam engine back in the 1800s, late 1800s, right? And they found that the hotter the steam engine was, the more work it could do, and as it got colder and colder, right, couldn't get as much work out of it. Right? So the second law of thermodynamics, and that's why it's called thermo for heat, and dynamics meaning right activity. Um, so it applied originally to heat and energy. But now we apply it to matter. Things fall apart. We apply it to information. You know, sense to nonsense. You don't get sense from nonsense, you get nonsense from sense. You sense what I mean? <laughs> Genetics, we go from perfect to mutations. Right? It's always downhill. And evolution is constantly striving to buck this system and it, it just can't. It doesn't have the intelligence needed to do that. Uh, with life, we have health, going to sickness and death and coronavirus and all that stuff. All right. So the Big Bang was proposed because scientists had to have a way around the second law of thermodynamics. So they proposed the Big Bang, which is incredibly unscientific. It is the, absolutely the worst science to ever come down the pike. Right? Absolutely. Now, we know that plus one minus one equals zero. You know, you add those two together, you get zero, and say, wow, that is the answer to our problem. So, zero then must equal plus one minus one. Right? You see that, that trick there, a the mathematical trick? All right? And then, of course, they assigned the plus one to matter, and the minus one they assigned to antimatter. All right. Wow. Whew. Solved that problem, didn't I? All right. Now the beautiful thing about that Big Bang is that there's no, well, there's no scientific laws to support it. The, the, big, the, the cool thing about it, though, is that it's scientific. It's naturalistic, materialistic. God is excluded. And therefore, we're all going to sing hallelujah, right? All of us atheists are going to sing hallelujah because God is excluded. And we love that when we got a theory that 
leaves God out of the picture. All right, so that's the big bang for you. All right. You know, God anticipated all false philosophies uh, like atheism, pantheism, polytheism, materialism, evolutionism, humanism, uniformitarianism, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. All right. Um, a guy by the name of Kurt Gödel. Does anybody know who Kurt Gödel is? Kurt Gödel. All right. We've got one mathematician in the audience. <laughs> Kurt Gödel was an Austri Austrian mathematician, and he was probably Einstein's closest friend. Um, and they were like two peas in a pod. Uh, it, it's been said that, that only Kurt Gödel could really understand Albert Einstein and, and vice versa. Um, and he, Kurt Gödel developed mathematically what has been called the incompleteness theorem. And it goes like this. Anything you can draw a circle around cannot explain itself without referring to something outside the circle. Something you have to assume but cannot prove. All right? So it's like a presupposition. So, and he gives the example of a, a bicycle. And you say, well, the bicycle, the, the, the origin of that bicycle it does not lie within the bicycle. It lies somewhere outside the bicycle. And you say, I know where it is. It came from a bicycle factory. Yes. Absolutely. Came from, so let's go to the bicycle factory. And so you go to the bicycle factory and say, okay, now, the bicycle factory, the, the origin of that bicycle factory, where did it come from? Well, it came from investors, bankers, um, uh, the guys that, that uh, invent the bicycle. Uh, you know, all, all these different people, are, you know, the workers that put them together. So all these people have to come from outside the bicycle factory to, to, to build the bicycles in the factory. And so you see we keep on drawing bigger and bigger circles around things, and eventually we end up drawing a circle around the entire physical universe. And then once again, for the 5,000th time, we say, okay, where did the physical universe come from? Well, according to the last 5,000 answers I've given you, it comes from outside the physical universe. Well, wait a minute. If God was a physical being, he would be inside the physical universe. So that means he's a supernatural being. He's outside of the physical universe. He is transcendent. Right? So each cause, and God being the ultimate cause, is greater than its effect. So as you work your way down, you see that. Each cause is greater than its effect. Anything that we can build as humans is less than us. All right? Okay. Let's look at proof of God. You can't prove God formally, but you can't build a coherent description of the universe without it, without a first cause and a source of order. You've got to have order. When we draw the biggest possible circle around the entire universe, we find that the universe is finite, and Einstein's theory of relativity depends upon the universe having a boundary. There is a limit to the universe, right? And beyond that limit is God. Right? So whether you're talking about matter, energy, time, space, there is a limit. So when the universe cannot explain itself, what is ever outside the universe, outside the biggest circle is, would be boundless and immaterial and not a system of parts. It's indivisible and it's an uncaused cause. So when, when Richard Dawkins says, well, who created God? Right? That's a third grade quite third grader question would ask. A third grader would ask that question. Well, who created God? Well, whoever created God it would be God. Right? So let's right, we can I think we can we can stop with we can stop with God. So information had to come from outside the circle. It had to come from outside the circle. All right. You know, there is a law of common experience. Now I don't know how many of these I, I think I made up a lot of these names of laws myself, but that that's all right. I'm trying to get Trying to get famous here. The law of common experience says that in 100% of the cases, you can always trace something that's complex back to an intelligent source. In 100% of the cases, whether you're looking at a, a, a machine, artwork, a musical composition, a lot literary work, a film, no, no matter if it's complex, it came from an intelligent source. And that, of course, would be a human, right? There's no exception. Well, except for one. 
the atheist says. And what is that exception? Living things, the most complex matter known to mankind, just happens by itself, right? You cannot explain the clothespin naturally, but you certainly, according to them, can, that can be explained by nature. Right? I know, it's a fairy tale. It's a fairy tale. All right. So, let's look at the definition of supernatural. Are human beings supernatural objects? Supernatural beings. How many of you think that humans are supernatural beings? I'm waiting for more hands to go up. <laughs> All right. Why are you? Because we're created in God's image. We are above nature, right? We are. We've got the dominion mandate, right? We control, right? We we have pretty much. We're given control of nature. Do humans humans have supernatural powers? Yes or no? Yes. Why? Why do humans have supernatural powers? We can create things language, machines, works of art. Animals can't do that, right? We can do things that no other creature in, in, in creation can do. So we are created in God's image, and so we do have some supernatural powers. We can't create ex nihilo, right? Granted, is, is a, a close bit of supernatural object? Yes, it is. What? You're only one? Yeah. It's a supernatural object. It doesn't have supernatural power, it's not a supernatural being, but could nature ever produce a clothespin? Never. It is above nature. Right? Nature could never produce one. Right? So in a sense, it is a supernatural object. And how did it get to be supernatural? From a supernatural brain given to us by the supernatural God. So we go from God to humans to clothespin. Right? If, if that's too weird for you, <laughs> I know, it is weird. All right. In the beginning, God created ex nihilo out of nothing, and he only did three baras in Genesis. There are only three ex nihilo creations in Genesis. The first one is for matter, water. second one is for animal life in verse 21. The third one is the spirit of God in man. All right. There is no natural explanation for the existence of any one of those three things. Matter is supernatural, so you can consider the entire universe as being supernatural, right? Because there is no natural explanation for matter, no natural explanation for life, any kind of life, and no explanation for, for man. Now, we do have some contranatural explanations that go against this, that go against nature. For matter, of course, we got the Big Bang. Totally unscientific, but we got it, right? For, uh, for life, we have chemical and biological evolution. So they've got an answer for all three of these. Right? It, this is a concerted effort by Satan to, to undo the three baras that God spoke in Genesis chapter 1. And for the spirit of God in man, finally, after, you know, after having all these computers, we have artificial intelligence that they're working on. Artificial intelligence. Someday these computers are going to be so smart, they're going to be human. Do you believe that? I don't believe that. But there's a lot of scientists that, that want to believe that. Um, in in uh, Psalm 51.10, there is one of the few barahs found in the Bible. And this is a beautiful barah. Uh, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do you know what the word create is? Take a guess. It's bara. Ex nihilo, construction out of nothing. Not a stone heart like we have. Not a heart of flesh like we have. We're talking out of nothing. So God creates in us a brand new heart. Our good works aren't going to cut it. They're not going to be able to create that clean heart. And a lot of people want to think that they can create a clean heart just by cleaning up their act. You know, being a better person, obeying the Ten Commandments, doesn't work. Okay? Um, all right. Other examples of bra creations. There's a few more. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. 
Behold, all things become new. And one of the most beautiful ones is in Jeremiah. For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth, a woman shall compass a man. And that, of course, is the, the prophesy of Mary having a virgin birth child, Jesus. Right? And that is the word Barah. Wow. That is a supernatural creation. Um, you know, in, in uh, Genesis 2, 3, it says God created and made. And he makes a distinction between creating something, ex nihilo, and making it. You know, we make a clothespin, but we don't, we don't bara a clothespin. Right? God did not bara the stars into existence. He spoke them into existence, but he made them out of pre-existing matter that he created on day one. All right, let's take a look at, at information by chance. Uh, evolution is, 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 you're going to see evolution is going to be a real failure here. We're going to take the theory of evolution four words. There's 23 letters and spaces in this phrase. And uh, so we're going to lay down 26, uh, 26 Scrabble letters on the board. We're going to turn them all over. They're going to be A through Z. And we'll put in one spacer, a, a blank one for the space. And uh, the probability of spelling that, that phrase by chance would be 127th, uh, 23 times. Right? Uh, a draw is as far as you can go before failure. And uh, we would ex expect to succeed once in 834 million trillion trillion draws. Now, just to spell the word the, T-H-E, it's uh, one out of uh, almost 20,000. Your chance of spelling just the word the is about 1 out of 20,000. So you're not going to get much past the, believe me, before you've got to start over again. And, uh, and it would take you uh, at a billion draws per second using a high-speed computer, uh, you, it would take you about 2.6 million trillion years to spell that four-word phrase, which a third grader could spell. So you can see that, that intelligence really does help, doesn't it? It really does help. All right, um, let's take a look at day one. I know we're running out of time, and I apologize. And, uh, um, day one, earth was formless and void, and it, it talks about water. Did Dilbert overlook the fact that, that, you know, that the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God? Ah, here we see a big ball of water. You're, you're going to have hump, Russ Humphrey coming, aren't you? And you've had him before, haven't you? And he spoke on this same the same thing. How many of you have heard Russ speak about uh, the day one and day two of, of creation? Phenomenal, phenomenal. So he's got a book called Starling Time. And um, anyway, we're gonna we're gonna skip over Vav consecutive. Uh, all that means is that there are a whole bunch of ands in a row. It's used to indicate historical narrative text, and you find it in historical books like Gospels. Um, uh, Acts, Revelation, which is history, future. Uh, so you see a lot of ands, and this, and that, and then, you know, right? Uh, used 55 times just in Genesis 1, 2100 times in the book of Genesis, and it eliminates the poetic allegorical claims where they say, well, the, the days were really millions, hundreds of millions of years. No, this is written in, in, in Vav consecutive or historical narrative which means everything follows closely one after another after another. There are no big time gaps in between one sentence and another. Right? It all flows into one continuous narrative. All right. Um, you know, the word, the word uh, day is the, the Hebrew word yom, y-o-m. Uh, God called the, day, the light day, evening and darkness he called night, evening and morning on the first day. You notice that, that he uses the uh, the light part of the day, day, daytime, right? And then it's also a day is 24 hours, day and night together. We, we do the same thing, right, in our culture. In fact, we even add, in my father's day, which might have been back in the 1920s or, you know, long, long time ago, right, can refer to past or a long period of time, right? But it doesn't, doesn't typically mean millions of years, right? But so the context is very important. In, in Genesis 1, we see a lot of uses of evening and morning along with numerical adjectives like first day, second day, third day, fourth day, and so on. And 
these evening and morning with day always means a 24-hour day, no exceptions. First, second, third, fourth day always means a 24-hour day, no exceptions. And we see up here that, that uh, days one, two, and three had no sun, and a lot of people point this out and they say, how can you have a day without the sun? Well, if God provides the light, you know, what difference does it make? And in Revelation chapter 22, it says God is going to provide the light for the new heavens and the earth. So there's going to be no sun. It, it says that. There will be no need for the sun. God himself will provide the light for the new heavens and the new earth. And you're not going to get sunburned by it either. Well, that's great. Now, in Exodus 20, 11, God, with his own finger, wrote out on tablets of stone that he created the earth in six literal 24-hour days and rested on the seventh so that we would have a model for the week. Right? And that's where we get our week from. Now, evening and morning is another problem, isn't it? Why do we in the Western world say day, a day starts with the morning and progresses through to the evening? The Jews start with evening first and then morning. Their, their day starts at 6 o'clock at night, goes to the next 6 o'clock at night. Why? Well, air, evening comes from the word Hebrew word erev, which means darkness, but it also means chaos. Think about that. When are you most likely to stub your toe? Right? It's when you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and you, right, you stub your toe in the dark, right? Right? Because it's chaotic. Things are chaotic, right? In the in the dark. Right? Morning may, comes from the Hebrew word boker, but and that means light, but it also means order. So what God was telling us when he always put evening first was that the six days of creation were six major steps in turning chaos into order. Chaos into order. So on the seventh day, we're going to see how, why that there's no evening and morning on the seventh day. Right? Here's a, kind of an entropy profile of the universe. And uh, at day zero, there was maximum disorder, and God spoke the matter into existence, and, and nuclear fusion started happening, and and Water was being turned into uh, uh, all the different elements on the periodic table. And as a chemistry teacher, I can vouch for the idea that fusion does work. And it works at an incredible speed, like an atomic bomb type speed. All right, so here we go all the way up through day six, higher and higher and higher levels of, of order. And finally, on day six, God pronounced everything, what? Very good, which means perfect. Right? People were perfect. Right? Everybody was good looking. Adam and Eve were both perfect people. All right. Now, on the seventh day, there's no evening and morning. Why? Why didn't he have to do anything on the seventh day? It was perfect at the end of the sixth day. He ceased creating. He ceased turning a little bit of disorder into in order. Because it was all it was all perfect. Alright. Uh, you know, a lot of people are, are are confused by the second day. You know, God separating the water from the waters. How many of you are confused by it? Be honest. How many of you are confused by the second day? There's no honest people there. All right. That has always confused me. I'm going to just confess it. I have always been confused by the second day. I just did couldn't understand what was so Think about water evaporating, going up into the air, you know? Um, so, uh, Henry Morris, who most of you probably know, are, or know of, are, uh, came up with a canopy theory. And he said that, the, that there was a, uh, a canopy of water surrounding the earth, and, and that canopy reflected sunlight. It made the, uh, the whole uh, earth kind of subtropical, uh, a paradise, perfect place for people to live, very uh, even illumination, right? And um, so uh, cut out ultraviolet light, which meant people lived a lot longer because they didn't get sunburned and all this kind of stuff, right? And, um, uh, and a lot of people have commented on that, uh, including uh, Stephen Gould, who was an atheist, um, died a number of years back, but uh, 
you know, he, he says, uh, I do realize that the biggest of all bosses labored with maximal sweat and diligence during those first six days. Perhaps it would be wise not to carper criticize, but I must confess I've always been puzzled by the paltriness of accomplish, accomplish, accomplishment on the second day, right? Um, for the import of this episode seems almost derisory compared with the scope of all the others. Did God need a breather right after his initial effort in the creation business? In other words, water evaporating or going up into creating this haze or something up in, you know, it doesn't look like a lot. And yet, Ru uh, Russ Humphrey in his book Starlight and Time really sheds a light on it. And uh, Ed Boudreaux, who I hope a lot of you know, passed, passed away a few years ago, um, wrote a, a book uh, along the same lines uh, dealing with aqua nucleosynthesis, meaning aqua meaning water and nucleosynthesis meaning fusion, uh, you know, combining that, those H, the hydrogen and oxygen atoms together into, you know, bigger and bigger, bigger atoms. Um, and of course, in 2 in Peter, it says we deliver, overlook the fact heavens existed long ago, earth was formed out of water by water, through the Word of God. And uh, that gives us a pretty good clue that God made the earth out of water. Right? And, uh, whoa. So here is, uh, here, this is Russ Humphrey's uh, vision of that uh, first, second, and fourth day. Uh, God starts with a ball of water at least two light years in diameter, uh, 12 trillion miles in diameter about 1,600 times the diameter of our solar system, that would account for all the, the visible mass in the universe. All the stars, all the galaxies, planets, and everything, um, they, astronomers somehow were able to figure out the approximate weight of these, all this stuff. And, uh, and they came up with, okay, a ball of water that big would account for all the mass, the weight of, of all the, the galaxies and stars that we see in the universe. So that's what God started with. And it was probably much bigger than that, but it was at least that. And, uh, and then on day two, that expanded. Right? That expanded big time. It, uh, in God, in, throughout Scripture, it talks about God stretching out the firmament. Right? Stretching it out. And um, so the earth is what's left at the very, very center. And so, Russ and I also believe that we are close to the center of the universe. We are close to the center. We may not be the exact center, but we're close to the center. Right? And uh, the, uh, the stars were made on day four from a lot of this material that was thrown out by this massive explosion uh, from a white hole. So the black hole basically sucked everything in and produced so much gravity and so much pressure that a fusion reaction started, ignited, and that literally transformed that water into, you know, everything, right? H hydrogen and oxygen can be made into all the elements that make up a solar system, or make up the universe. Okay. All right. We're gonna keep, there's a lot of, a lot of recurring themes in, in scripture in dealing with water. You know, for example, Genesis 1, uh, 8, you know, water to universe, and we've got uh, Nile River turning into blood, we've got bitter water into sweet water, we've got Jesus turning water into wine, right? So, right, a lot of, a lot of things dealing with water, right? Uh, that's for day one and two. All right, in day two, we see uh, water's being parted above and below, right? That's the big expansion. We see Moses parting the Red Sea. We see Joshua parting the Jordan. Elijah parting the Jordan. Elisha parting the Jordan. Kind of a theme, isn't it? Right? Water is a big deal in Scripture. Right? Um, Jesus turning uh, water into wine. You think it was an accident that it happened to be six stone jars and not five? Right? Not eight? Why six? Could be a clue. You know, we talk about a modus operandi, you know, you know, detectives always look for an M.O. Well, the M.O. for Jesus is water into something, right? We're running out of time, I know. All right. So, 
Why seven days? Why seven days? Well, goes back to the mousetrap. You say, how do you compare seven days to a mousetrap? Well, the mousetrap has got to be built all at the same time, doesn't it? All at the same time. You can't build it over a period of years and years and expect to catch any mice. You've got to put all the pieces together, you know, pretty much at once, right? And removal of any part ruins it. So how does that compare? Well, let's take a look. That's called irreducible complexity. It applies to machines, biological reaction chains like blood clotting mechanism. Um, it applies to cells, tissues. All these things have to work together to make a human body functional, right? Uh, time, space, and matter we talked about all working together. You, you can't have one without the other. It's a package deal, right? There's over 200 non-living parameters for designing a universe. Physicists have been studying this for years, and they found that it, it, it's got to be within a, a per, couple of percentage points. Each one of these parameters has got to be just tweaked. It, it's like tuning a big soundboard exactly right. Every, there's 200 do, knobs, and they got to get every one exactly right. And if one is off by five, five percentage points, the whole thing falls apart. Okay? It is an amazing thing that God did when he put the universe together. And of course, we've got a lot of biotic living things that have to be just right. So God really almost had to do it in six days. Right? He, he, he really, <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to force it on God, but he really couldn't have done it in six million years or 600 million years. He couldn't. You know? I mean, take a look at this, uh, the flower and the bee. Right? Look at the flower and the bee. Everything's got to be perfect. You've got to have the sun that's producing just the right spectrum of light, uh, the right distance from the sun for just the right amount of heat. You've got to have water. You've got to have oxygen, carbon dioxide. You've got to have, uh, you know, the bee and the flower have got to complement each other. You know, I mean, there are just so many things that are perfectly matched. What happens if we lose the honeybee? We're dead. Right? We have crop failures like crazy. We can't grow apples. We can't grow all kinds of crops because they are pollinated by the honeybee. And if the honeybee is, isn't, isn't there, all these plants are going to eventually end up dying. They're not going to produce food for us. We're in big trouble. So you see how important it is that every species of life is important in this package that God put together in a very short amount of time. Try doing that with a try doing that with a, the tree of life over hundreds of millions of years. What are your chances of success? <laughs> about zero. About zero. Yeah. In, instead, God created the forest of life. Look at the beauty of that. Individual kinds of animals, individual kinds of plants. That diverse, and he gave them the ability to diversify and produce a lot of different, you know, species in that kind. So we have lots of different varieties of dogs and, you know, cats and and so on. All right, um, we are, uh, you know, we are spiritual beings. Uh, we are made in God's image. So we've got all of these these properties that remind us of God. All right, we're gonna. We're going to buzz through this. We've got a lot of... Um, uh, we've got the Dominion Mandate. Oh, this, is one of the, this is one of the most important slides. I've got a lot of important... But uh, I've got to tell you about the book that made your world by the show. There's a number of books like this that, that show the importance of how Scripture changed the world. And this one really goes back, and every chapter goes back to the idea that that we are created in God's image, and therefore we do science. We have, we develop technology to ease our burden. We have orphanages, right? We have uh, education for everybody. We have charities, hospitals, sexual morality, right? All these things are all go back to the idea that we are created in God's image. So that's a very very important concept that changed the Western world. And you look at non-Western cultures; they don't have a lot of this stuff. You know, women are second and third class citizens. They don't have the right to vote or to, well, anyway. And a, a, lot, of, a lot of cultures that are not biblical, uh, you know, you can see the vast differences between our two 
All right. All right, here comes, here's the Model T, and so can we explain it using all these laws? What's missing? What do we need, right, besides laws and processes? We need agency. A guy like Henry, right, Ford, I mean, all right. So we need God to put this, you know, put these laws to, to good use. Now we're going we're gonna to skip over spontaneous generation. This is an important slide. Uh, there are four different stories or accounts of creation here. All right? The first one, I believe, is the only true one. Uh, it is a story. I'm sorry, it's an account, not a story. <laughs> Stories are like fairy tales, right? So this is an account um, written by God as an eyewitness. Uh, Cinderella is a fairy tale. And one thing that they have in common, though, is that Cinderella's fairy godmother is intelligent. Not very powerful, but at least she's, got, she's smarter than a rock. Wouldn't you agree? Fairy godmother is smarter than a rock, so step, definitely a step up from evolution. All right, spontaneous generation says that a pile of garbage is going to produce rats and fleas and, 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 and flies. But, uh, and, and it was believed for thousands of years by very smart people. Right? But, it, but it, it took Louis Pasteur and a few others to really kill it. And as soon as it was killed, evolution appears on the scene. You, you just can't kill this thing. Right? Spo evolution is the new spontaneous generation. And what's the difference between the two? Spontaneous generation takes a week or two to generate the rats and the flies. Evolution takes millions and millions and millions of years. That's the only difference, really. Right. So a frog to a prince, very possible with evolution. Right? Not so with the fairy tale or the Cinderella story. So vast ages distance us from reality. Right? That's the whole purpose for the, the you know, the deep time is to is to keep us from realizing how stupid it really is. All right. One of my favorite cartoons, Gary Larson, Farside. And you guys know Gary Larson, Farside cartoons? I think that stopped probably 20 years ago. I'm dating myself, I know. A long time ago. God as a kid tries to make a chicken in his room. And what happened, folks? Big explosion. Feathers all over the place. Utter failure. Utter failure. And uh, so he's got to start over. But fear not. He lives forever. He just keeps at it. Keeps going. Over hundreds of millions of years, he's going to get it right. That's what time does to our picture of God. Right? Power. This is a physics formula. But, but guys especially are always interested in this equation because it deals with horsepower. It, it deals with how fast you can get a speeding ticket when you've got this souped up Camaro or Mustang, right? The more, the, the less time you can use to do zero to 60, the faster, you know, the more power you got. And the more the girls are impressed. It's really the girl's fault, isn't it, guys? <laughs> All right, so as time gets greater, power gets smaller. So creating the universe in six days requires a lot more power than creating the universe in 15 billion years. So, all right. Uh, there's a movie called Exodus, and they, they, in the movie they put this little kid, about 11-year-old bald-headed kid, and he was God in talking to Moses. And, uh, and the reviewer writes, he says, Scott's portrayal of God makes him almost unnecessary in the, in the film to the point that Exodus wouldn't have suffered much if he had not been in it. And I totally agree. The film was ludicrous. Um, Matt Ridley is an atheist, and he logically explained every one of the ten plagues on Egypt. <laughs> wow. Wouldn't theistic evolution suffer would theistic evolution suffer much if God wasn't in it? That's my big question for you. Would theistic evolution suffer very much if God wasn't in it? And I would maintain to you, it wouldn't suffer a bit. Because it's virtually identical with atheistic evolution. All right, there's a lot of implications for a small God. And you can take a look at them here. Uh, there's a lot of implications for having a small God. 
Um, you know, we don't see how badly we offend a holy God. You know? And a lot of us, a lot of people don't really care. Right? They're having too much fun. And lots of examples of small gods. The God of theistic evolution being one of them. Uh, the Catholics have got a few in here. Christ nailed to the cross. Christ is a piece of bread. Christ is a helpless baby. That's a Mexican Catholic um, uh, cultural thing. Um, uh, but here's one of my favorites. If you don't believe uh, Moses, how will you believe my words? So the, the, the Christian who does not believe what Moses wrote back in Genesis may have a tough time with believing what God, what Jesus Christ said. And remember that Christ is the creator. Right? All through the New Testament, he is identified as the creator. And there are thousands of eyewitnesses right, to what he did. Right? Um, and of course, there, we're going to experience, we may possibly experience some, some, some uh, instantaneous miracles ourselves. You know, like the rapture, instantaneous dematerialization, and a new glorified body with perfect DNA. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Are your socks blown off? Wow. A lot of reasons why we should be totally blown away by Genesis chapter 1. Right? It is an amazing, amazing display of God's attributes. All right? You know, the, the one that gets me the most is Christ dying in our place for our sins. That is the most amazing. To think that the creator of the entire universe would put himself up on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins absolutely blows me away. And, uh, and yet there are still people that say, don't need it. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to be so good. I'm going to be the Mother Teresa of Colorado. Right? And I'm going to work my way to heaven. Not going to happen. God is going to reject your attempt at self-righteousness and trying to, un, uh, trying to replace what Christ has already done for you. Uh, we, we've got a lot of idols that we worship, don't we? Uh, nothing really, really has changed all that much in three or 4,000 years. And I believe that theistic evolution is really idol worship. And, and I don't mean that, you know, you're, we're bowing down to it, but it's a, it's a God that, re, that has replaced, this is a God that has replaced the God of the Bible. And so ask yourself the question, is the God portrayed throughout Scripture the same as the God of theistic evolution? And I would maintain there is no resemblance whatsoever. No resemblance. Right? You know, evolution equals time plus mutations. That's the formula. Time plus mutations plus natural selection. And would God share his glory with time that he created? You know, you got guys like uh, George Wallace who says, given enough time, anything can happen. Time itself does the creating. That's crazy. Mutations. Those are degradations of what God put together. Natural selection. Killing off of the weak. Is that how God operates? Whoa. And yet that's what theistic evolution is really based on. It's actually based on just plugging God into, you know, this, this weird thing that we call evolution. That's all I got for you tonight. Thank you very much. I'll give this back to you in just a minute. Okay. So, um, all right. Well, um, thank you. That was great talk. Um, so we're going to commence with the uh, extended Q and A at this point. So uh, have your questions ready. Uh, we normally pass the basket around, but since nobody can reach anybody else, um, I'm going to ask Martin and somebody that he might appoint to uh, just kind of do that as, as an usher might. And um, so if you have anything to contribute, it would be welcome, but uh, no obligation. 
Um, and what you put in the basket goes into uh, the Rocky Mountain Creation Fellowship to offset the cost of us uh, bringing speakers in. So uh, what we're going to do for the Q&A is um, normally I pass the mic, but you know why we're not going to do that tonight. Um, so um, if you have a question, just make known to, uh, uh, to Jim that you want to ask a question. And so then when he recognizes, you can go ahead and ask the question. And speak your question loudly since you want to have a microphone. But we will have his wife up here to hear the question and speak it into the microphone. Yeah. Or is that the way you yeah, my, my hearing is, is uh, mutated. <laughs> I'm, wait, I'm, I'm waiting for better hearing in the next life of bullying. <laughs> um, so my wife is going to help me out a little bit. Okay. So the idea will be that they'll repeat the question into the microphone uh, so that everybody can hear what the question was before he starts with the answer. So we'll just do that and we'll just go and go and go until nobody has anything else to say. And also, if you have not just a question, but if you just want to have a comment or something, um, that would be welcome too. I consider this sort of a question and answer and discussion time. So, um, so we'll just go until uh, either everybody leaves or 9.15 rolls around, at which point we will formally break. Okay, so why don't we go? Uh, I'd just like to say that if any of you would like a copy of this PowerPoint, because I, I did have to go through quite a few of the slides pretty quickly, and if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint, give me your, your email address and I will shoot you a copy of it. It's under 25 megabytes, so it'll, I, can, I can do that uh, fairly easily. And, uh, and then you got it and you can you know, look at it at your leisure too. So, um, so first question, anybody? I got one. Yeah, Rob. <laughs> um, kind of early on, you mentioned that. Okay. Sorry, you're, you're here close by. Yeah, I guess I'm cleared, aren't I? So, um, early on, you mentioned that uh, that Einstein's theory of relativity uh, suggested that there was a boundary or required a boundary right. to be in the universe. I was wondering if you could go into that a little bit and explain why and how that is. Well, um, remember what you said about, e about equations? For every equation, your audience is cut in half. <laughs> That's a lot of equations. Uh, but uh, the, the, one of the reasons why they believe there is a boundary, remember that layer of water going around the entire universe? That is not included in the, tw the two light year ball of water, right? Now, two light years means uh, 12 trillion mile diameter ball of water, incredible ball of water. So that's not included. That that is only the water that is used to make uh, all the stars, galaxies, planets, and planet Earth, right? And uh, so there is something beyond the universe that is attracting the galaxies at an increasing speed. The the galaxies are accelerating away from the Earth in all directions that we look the galaxies are accelerating away from the Earth. They're not slowing down, they're speeding up. There seems to be something that is pulling them, attracting them, you know, gravitationally, toward the outer boundaries of the universe. And uh, they believe, Russ Humphrey, and you can ask him this, really quiz him on this, and I think he would be a better, a better guy to answer that question than I am regarding Einstein's theory of relativity, but, um, but there is this great attractor, meaning the sphere of water, that has so much gravity that it is literally accelerating the, the, the galaxies toward it. Um, so that's all I could really say. Um, I, but apparently the, the theory of relativity does not work if, it, if there's not a boundary. I'm not into the cosmology or into the... So, you know, you, you've got me partially stumped, but Russ Humphrey is on his way. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Ask him that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Other questions? 
If there are no questions, I'm going to start singing, and then you are going to be sorry. <laughs> yes? So you made a statement that God cannot lie, right. and I agree with that. Yeah. And you pointed out the verse, Hebrews 11, 3. Right. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Right. So if we leave out the word not, things which are seen were made of things which do appear, that would be ex nihilo. Okay. out of nothing okay. but he says it's it's not made that way therefore god did make it out of poof there it is so i would propose that god may have used e equals mc squared right energy coming from god turns into matter that we see so it didn't pop out of nothing it's coming from him the right. energy right. so it's not ex nihilo it's coming from energy into matter. Good. Okay. I want to. I want to comment on it. Good. Good. Yeah. Good comment. Um, I just read a book called Energy Is Therefore God Could Be, and uh, the physicist author of that book starts with the premise that God starts with energy and equals m c squared, like you point out. He converts the energy into matter, and time extends from the matter. That time is dependent upon matter. And so the, 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 uh, the flow of this would be energy from God, right? Holy Spirit energizing, right? Producing matter, which would be the, the water. And then, and then, of course, along with that, that matter comes the package of time and space. And um, so, yeah, you're right. And, and I, I don't know how to, what, whether it's the, the uh, creating something out of, something that can't be seen, whether that's ex nihilo creation or whether it's atoms. Because God did create the universe out of atoms, right? I mean, as part of the chain of events. Um, so, I, I, maybe if we, if we looked at the Hebrew a little more closely, we could, you know, get an answer to that question. So perhaps it would be good to look at that whole phrase, ex nihilo, nihil fit out of nothing right. nothing comes okay out of nothing nothing comes well that's a natural law um, it, it, you know the big bang says that everything in the universe came out of nothing it says a cosmic of quantum fluctuation suddenly nothing turned into you know everything so uh, i i don't know i i, I really don't i'm, I'm not i'm not a uh, cosmologist and I you know when you get when we get into into some of the you know this type of thinking I'm a little um, you know it's a little over my head I, I, and I acknowledge that you know and, but uh, and of course there's Bible scholar work to be done there as well you know so it's um, yeah thank you any other questions yes I can okay. speak loud enough for it. All right. I walk through my library, and I do a lot of research and all, and I see a lot of physicists, uh, students there. And I, every once in a while, I walk up to one of them, and I say, let's talk about Einstein's theory. E equals mass, be the M, and the C. What is the C? And they tell me, well, it's the speed of light. I said, now, wait a minute now. The speed of light is the fastest speed that we possibly know to mankind, right? How can you square the speed of light? And they can't answer it. You know, while they come up with this theory and this theory and all that. But if the speed of light is the fastest known. Right, but there is a speed to it, 300, meter, 300, uh, 300 million meters per second. And how do you square it? Square 300? Well, then you're going to have per second squared, right? Yes. <laughs> you know, you get into some, some higher level math that is really over my head. And uh, I, I do know that, that when you approach the speed of light, time stops still. Okay. Time stops. Um, and that's the, the Lorentz uh, Feingold uh, equation that Einstein used to develop his, his theory of relativity. Um, and so the, a lot of weird things happen with mass and, and uh, time and the length of, of, of an object. 
they all change as you get real, real close to the speed of light, or as you actually be, are at the speed of light. Uh, so, but I, yeah. How do you measure? I don't know. Don't know. Yeah. Good, good question. Okay. But I've asked these physicist students, and they yeah. might say the same thing. The guy to ask, Russ Humphrey. <laughs> okay. He's he's a nuclear fusion scientist. He uh, he has developed some really neat theories regarding time dilation that really work. They have been proven. And uh, so I think you're going to want to save that question for him. So I'm not going to try to buffalo you <laughs> at all. They don't know me. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Well, since we're having discussion, I could trick take a crack at trying to answer that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, the formula E equals MC squared is uh, a, it's a formula that's, that's derived from the, the foundational postulates of, of, of the theory of relativity. And the theory of relativity is a, it's a, it's a theory of physics so it starts with a couple of postulates, but once you apply those postulates and you th throw in all the rest of the physics, you begin deriving equations. And so when you, when you begin deriving the, the equations, one of the predictions that comes out of the theory of relativity is this relationship between mass, M, and energy, E. And so that equation is saying that mass is related to energy. You can convert mass to energy by applying the speed of light, the constant speed of light, by applying it twice, as a factor of twice. It's not saying that you can go the speed of light squared <coughs> speed. It's not saying that. It's saying that this constant C is intrinsic to every derivation of any physical formula that really that exists. When you, when you begin taking the laws of physics and dump them into, um, into, into the, the theory of relativity, all of a sudden the constant C crops up everywhere. So in that equation, you're not being asked to imagine that there's something going the square of the speed of light as a speed. Because if you square the speed of light, you don't get a speed squared. You get meters squared per second squared. That's not, that's not a speed of any kind. It's, it's, a, it's a thing of a completely different set of units. So, so, and it's necessary to do that because energy doesn't have the units of, of, of mass and it doesn't have the units of speed either. It's got the units of mass times, time, times um, distance squared divided by speed squared. What is that? Well, it's a completely different sort of en entity and you need the, you need the constant C to be applied twice in that formula to do it. And you can actually um, go through all the math and come up with that equation. Um, so, for what that's worth. Um, <clears throat> Jim and I were having a discussion earlier, though, that, about equations and that Every time you put an equation in, in, in a paper, it divides your audience in half. Um, apparently, people don't just naturally relate to equations. And so, um, in order to be able to answer that question, you have to be able to say, you, you, you can't just say that this is a, a speed being being multiplied by itself. It's not a speed. You have to stop imagining it as a speed. C is a constant and it appears everywhere in the, those equations. And I probably was largely unsuccessful in answering your question, but perhaps there's a, that's another, offers another perspective on how to view it. So, yeah. 
Thank you. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate the help there. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Questions? I guess. All right. Well, I guess. I'd say again, if you if you want me to send you um, the PowerPoint, give me your email address. I'd be happy to do that. So, 